Thank you. So I'm Paul. This is Patrick. Uh, we're with Dots. And for those that uh, don't know about Dots, uh, we're a uh, small, relatively small mobile game studio in New York, about 35 people. Uh, some of the most talented designers, developers, marketers that, that I've ever worked with. Uh, we've launched two games. And as of today, we've launched three. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a second. And the first two games have reached about 75 million people. Um, most of those have come in our second game, which is called Two Dots. And that was a game that uh, actually, when we launched it, it hit number one in about 100 countries around the world. Uh, so what we want to do is spend a few minutes talking about designing a game studio and sort of try to expose some of the internal tension that existed between uh, Patrick and myself uh, coming at this from a slightly different perspective. So to do that, we're gonna, I'm going to jump back to the beginning, sort of where the first game uh, Dots came from. Um, so in New York, uh, there's a startup incubator slash investor called Betaworks. And every two years, they have a hack and residence program where they basically ask eight people to pitch an idea and build it in about three or four months and launch a prototype. And sort of based on how well it does, uh, invest in it or kill it. And Paul was the, uh, the head of that hack and residence program in uh, January of 2013. So I kind of went in there, wasn't quite sure what I wanted to build, um, but there was this growing trend on the New York subway that uh, you know, people were just on their mobile phones playing more games than I had ever seen. Um, so there was a clear opportunity to sort of reach people who didn't consider themselves gamers um, and to make something that you know, stood out to me. There wasn't, it didn't feel like there was a game for me. Um, so to do that, I was sort of seeking inspiration. And I was thinking a lot about uh, a trip to Japan that I took the, the prior year, sort of like a once in a lifetime thing. Um, and during that trip, I uh, was introduced to the work of Yeo Kusama. I was actually in Matsumoto, where she's from, and they were doing this lifetime retrospective of all her work. And it's like very dot centric. Um, but what really stood out was this piece, especially. Um, and sort of how it works is that at the beginning of the exhibit, uh, the, it's just a stark white room. And then everyone who comes is handed a, a, a packet of stickers. And uh, throughout the lifetime of the exhibit, you're just encouraged to place them wherever uh, they want. And sort of over time, there's this uh, creative chaos that happens. And what sort of stood out about this was that you know, beauty and fun weren't mutually exclusive. They could sort of coexist and especially support each other. So I wanted to make a game that sort of felt like that. Um, so these are some early prototypes. Uh, what I basically did was start with uh, how I thought it should look, and then let a lot of the decisions come out of that. Um, you know, a lot of the games at the time and still are very cluttered, and there's like a lot going on. And I really wanted something that was minimalist and clean, and sort of uh, a, a pleasure to sort of experience. So these were early and pretty rough, but there was there was something there. And so at BetaWorks, we we passed around the demo, and there was uh, a real sign of life. People were sort of you know asking for ways to download it and how to give it to their friends and stuff like that. So we started to get feedback in sort of two ways. One was just anecdotal, people telling, you know, giving their thoughts on what, what we should work on next and how the scoring system should work and all that sort of stuff. And then we also had analytics. And it was like a really rough version of that. But what it did was give us the confidence that we were like on the right track, that people were playing this thing even when we, you know, outside of work and all that sort of thing. So this is what it looks like. Um, you connect dots of the same color uh, and sort of uh, there's a couple different modes to this version of the game. So quick tangent, uh, when I was in high school, there was this movie called Romeo plus Juliet by the director Boz Lerman, and it made muscle cars look amazing. And I really wanted a car with a, a convertible top. Um, but this was the car that I shared with my mom. Uh, but I also owned one of these. So I cut a sunroof in the car. And uh, you know, it wasn't perfect, but I was really proud of it. And this sort of felt like a metaphor for that original Dots game. It was something that I kind of you know, did out of a burst of inspiration, uh, kind of duct taped it together. It wasn't like, really great under the hood, but it was working. And so you know, there's kind of two ways to look at that. I felt like it was a childish mess. It was sort of like this you know, thing that I only could see the flaws in. So I obviously didn't agree. Um, <laughs> I thought that I'd been involved in enough startups to know that when you have something that your, your wife that never plays anything that you ever ask her to play, or uh, no matter how much she, she loves you, when, when she can't put it down at, at 2 a.m., you know you've got something there. So for me, it was there's an opportunity here. 
And I think this was kind of the start of the tension uh, that I talked about earlier, where you know, I'm thinking about how do we turn this into a potentially big business, um, which wasn't necessarily how, you know, how Patrick was thinking about it. Yeah, it was, it was very much an art project in my head. But the sort of more we talked about it and, the, and sort of Paul laid out what we could make it into, it became really appealing. I was just so used to jumping from project to project uh, that this sounded really interesting to like kind of continue to dig deeper on a, on a single one. So the more we talked, we kind of came to this agreement, um, sort of the start of this you know, tension between business and uh, sort of creativity. And so kind of agreed to, to, to take a stab at it. Yeah. <laughs> and so we set out with these sort of principles of like, this is the type of game company that we wanted to build. So in short, we want to entertain. Uh, we're aiming to create well-designed, easy to approach, and stimulating games. We won't take advantage of our players, and we believe that decisions made for short-term gains will become long-term blemishes. So that was sort of this, uh, you know, we wanted to plant a flag that we could look to like, as we progress and make sure that we were sticking to the thing that we wanted to build. Um, so it had kind of this amazing uh, launch. And it was funny, like leading up to it, I, I knew there was something there, but I was kind of thinking about what was next. Um, but then once we launched it, it was kind of this night and day scenario. Um, so we did a million installs in the first week, uh, uh, 5 million in the first month, and about 20 million in the first year. Um, so there was clearly this sign of life that you know, Paul and I were discussing, uh, but we knew we had to grow the team. Like, at that point, I was doing all the design development, and Paul was sort of running the business aspect and just helping you know, get things going. Um, but we wanted to keep that sort of tension alive in the DNA of the company. So it was important to hire people, if they were programmers, if they also had like a, a, an eye for design or something like that. Those are the people that really stood out to us and that we wanted to work with and sort of you know, cultivate this uh, community of. Um, so we sort of, you know, had this mechanic, had a group of talented people, and so sort of like, what's, ne what, what's the next thing we're going we're gonna to build? And so to do that, we sort of looked at, to the first game for inspiration. There was a lot of stuff that we took out because it was intended to be very minimalist, and like, we only wanted to ship them something that was like 100% perfect, um, or close to that. Um, so there was like this idea of puzzles that was sort of floating around with the first one that everyone seemed to enjoy, but it just wasn't fully fleshed out. So we kind of took that team and sort of, you know, that was the design brief. Um, so that became Two Dots, the sequel that we re released about a year, maybe a couple months after the first title. Here's a quick video. <laughs> So that one launched and kind of exceeded the expectations we had for it. Um, you know, we, we put a lot of attention to detail in the art and the design and, and the music and sort of every aspect of it we put a lot of like love and care into. And it was pretty amazing to see that rewarded. So we surpassed a lot of the install numbers we saw with the first one. And what was majorly different was that this thing was making money. And so we, you know, Paul's sort of master plan for this business was like, you know, coming to fruition. I think it, it sounds like dots went well and then two dots uh, did better, but um, the reality is we learned a bunch of really tough lessons along the way, um, and we're still learning new ones every day. Uh, so the first one, uh, when we launched dots about a few, weeks, uh, a few weeks after that, we made an update, and we took away something that we didn't know people were using. Um, people were actually blowing up the phone on their iPad, and uh, they wanted to have large dots on the screen. So we made it iPad friendly, and we took that feature away, and we got what felt like hate mail uh, in the app review. And I think um, you know, it took us a little bit of time to remove the emotion from that and distill down the core thing that people were telling us, put that mode back into the game. And I think the lesson there is the quicker we can learn that, or anyone can learn that, the better off you'll be, and sort of get thick skin quick. Um, the second thing was uh, you know, really sort of thinking about what you're good at and what you're not yet good at. Uh, once we launched Dots, then we launched Two Dots. We're sort of confident. Let's, we're going to build a bunch of games. This is easy. Uh, turns out it's not so easy. And actually, uh, what we did the first few times, we, there was a lot of luck involved and a lot of hard work. Um, but when we distill it down, we, Patrick made the Dots mechanic. People like the Dots mechanic. We know how to build on top of that. And we also happen to be very good at marketing. So those are the two things that we're going to sort of focus on, at least for the next few phases of our growth. 
Another one, which was sort of counterintuitive to me as the sort of non-creative uh, in the company, is that when you bring on all these super creative people, uh, my instinct was let them roam free. And actually, we have one artist on the team that told me uh, a few weeks after he joined, he said, I need a deadline. Uh, I cannot work without a deadline. And it made me realize that uh, sort of unbounded creativity is, is actually uh, sort of a disaster. And so what we did was we put uh, this gated development and process in place so we ensure that projects move through a funnel and that if we have to kill them, which you often do in gaming, you kill it as early as possible and get that team working on something new. Another thing which was uh, maybe shouldn't seem like a hard lesson to learn uh, was around making money. Uh, we had a, a good friend at a Japanese, large Japanese game studio spent a few days with us in New York. And when he left, he said a lot of good things, but he said, look, the one thing you guys have to get comfortable with is asking people for money. Um, you guys are way too soft. And he's, he made a really good point. He said, if you're delivering something of value, people don't mind paying for it. And so I think it gave us permission to think about charging people for things and letting them pay us, and that, that can work out well. Our sort of safety net in that process was data science. And we waited probably a little too long to bring on an amazing data scientist, but once we did, it changed our world. We all of a sudden knew when we started turning dials uh, how it impacted retention, what impact uh, you know, making hard levels versus easy, easy levels had on monetization or user acquisition. And so having a super strong data scientist behind the scenes, making sure that you don't screw up, uh, was really comforting for the team. Yeah, so we sort of had been learning those lessons over the past you know, two years. And then we really put them into practice over the last three months. Um, we kind of introduced all these, you know, it was really when we hit our stride and sort of took all these really talented people and focused them on uh, like just two dots and sort of expanding that sort of uh, product that people loved and were, were wanted to play with. Um, and it had like this amazing impact on our revenue. Um, what was great about that to me was like, uh, you know, we, we stuck to those ideals that we set out in the early, in the early days. And, and we really just sort of delivered more of what people really enjoyed doing, which was playing the levels of the game um, and sort of expanding on that. And again, what Paul said, we, we knew we were de delivering this like, really high quality thing. Uh, and we sort of you know, saw a return on it, which is cool. So that's kind of where, how we started and where we're at today. We've got a few things coming, which I thought might be fun to share. Um, along the lines of what I said, I, you know, we think we do well um, is marketing. We're looking at creative ways to do marketing, not just buying ads on Facebook, uh, although that works well too. Uh, one thing we have coming up is a project that we were fortunate to work on um, with uh, the National Arts Club. And I'll let it play for a second, then I'll... So it's basically, um, it's, a, it's an immersive experience where the National Arts Club had pulled together 78 of the most iconic fashion and art people in the world and made this amazing tarot deck. And so, Patrick uh, built a version of this for the App Store. Uh, it'll obviously cross-promote to our game, but it, more importantly, it's a way for us to collaborate with these artists that we have a, a huge amount of respect for. And it's kind of cool. One of the contributing artists was Kusama, who like yeah. kicked the whole thing off. So this is another one. This is a, a video live-action commercial that we're going to be uh, launching in a few weeks. That sort of plays off this uh, idea that people have had about um, seeing dots after they play it. Uh, I mentioned a third game. So today, uh, actually, we went live with our partner Tencent in China. And we have a completely uh, new game out there. It's derived from two dots. But uh, it's being featured in the Apple App Store, and it's on the Tencent My App Store. Uh, so we're very excited. We haven't actually been in China yet, so this is a big day for us. Yeah, and just, uh, you know, we've really found a lot of life left in the, in the dots mechanic. And sort of like every time it feels like we've pushed it as far as it can go, it's like something new comes up. And again, like mixing in that, the sort of creative forces in the team has really helped unearth that stuff. Like when you get a new perspective on it, it's like kind of amazing what comes out of that. So just in summation, I feel like whenever we've gotten really too close to something, we, we kind of, Paul's helped like us zoom out and look at things on a, on a bigger scale and sort of, uh, I don't know, help us get through stuff. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you. Thanks so much.